Telecom Exchange CEO Roundtables, both for our guests here in the audience at Telecom Exchange NYC, and for our viewers joining us on Periscope, as well as on JSA TV. We'd also like to thank our Wi-Fi sponsor, Kelly Dry. Our third panel today is on the growth and trends of unified communications and its necessary network infrastructure needs. We're honored to have Mr. Evan Christel, social media business strategist with over 71,000 followers on Twitter, probably more by the, since it's been, what, a good half hour? <laughs> he is our number one social media influencer on Twitter for UCOM hashtag, as well as others. With 20 plus years of sales, alliances, and biz dev experience in the comms infrastructure and applications arena, Evan brings a unique perspective on opportunities in the unified communications and collaboration segment, including deep knowledge of social, mobile, and the voice, video, web, collaboration, market, and technology. I should also say he's probably the number one reason why Tech Cited is trending right now on Twitter. So we're, we're really proud and excited to have Evan. Thank you. Welcome, Evan. Oh, after the tweet, though. Go for it. <laughs> Thanks very much. It's great to be here. And uh, what an amazing event. I, I'm worried we may have scared off some of the uh, attendees here, but yeah. call, you know, calling it unified communications. I you know, hope next year we can maybe rename the panel like business communications or collaboration. Actually, a bug, you know, kind of bugbear of mine is the name unified communications. I think it's kind of long in the tooth. Probably a misnomer in terms of what the industry is all about. And uh, hopefully we can maybe correct some of the, the images that are portrayed, some of the old fashioned images that are out there about what unified communication is and the value it provides through this panel. So hopefully that's one of the goals. Maybe we could start with introductions. Michael, do you want to start? And we can work our way down and introduce yourself and uh, more importantly, you know, the role you play in the ecosystem because I think UC is about the ecosystem. It's not about a product or a service or a solution, but you know, your unique position within that ecosystem and your differentiation, the value you bring the, let's say, the community. Sure. Hi. Uh Nice to meet everyone, and if I'm saying something someone else had said on a panel before, raise your hand and I'll get the hint to shut up. Um, uh, so I'm the CEO of Metro Optic. Uh, we are a Canadian provider of fiber solutions and data center solutions. And uh, what do we bring to unified communications? Uh, first of all, I had to Google that term to uh, figure out what it really meant. Um, uh, so. Um, but there was no other term I could think of either that would do a good job of replacing that. So uh, JSA uh, certainly um, um, you know, uh, took the best term to explain something that's really important, which is uh, what, what does integration mean of you know, voice, video, and data? Um, what we provide at Metro Optic is three elements of that. Uh, we provide what I call supporting infrastructure, which is capacity both from a fiber perspective, where we have dark and lit fiber uh, solutions, and we own and operate that network. Uh, and then we have data centers in Montreal, uh, eight of those, um, and uh, one data center that we're just opening in Toronto. Um, and the third part, which is really the most important part, is the interconnect piece. So. We own one of the carrier densest sites in Canada, um, and uh, we just see that unified communications needs access to multiple providers. It's not just about redundancy, but it's also about the ability to reach eyeballs, um, and it's the ability to actually support applications, and I think that's the fundamental difference. Um, can you, what drives, what makes a good application? And, uh, and what do you need as supporting infrastructure to deliver that? And that's really what we're trying to, is our value proposition to the customers and the ability for us to interconnect to the providers, but at the same time reach the eyeballs through our metro fiber network to all the data centers in the area really makes a big difference. So. That's exactly what you, uh, how, how you introduced us, and I think it's, uh, it's, it's, it's dead on. Great, thank you. James? 
Sure. Uh, James Martino, how are you? Um, CEO of Avotis. We're about a 35-year-old firm. We have been providing our customers with visibility and the ability to manage usage data and investment data around their telecom networks for a long time now. Uh, within the unified communications space, we're very active. Uh, we are on an evangelical mission, actually, within the space. Uh, we believe that uh, unified communications are a key and important uh, part of the ecosystem as we migrate from the old TDM world to a VoIP world to a UC world and a collaborative world. And however, we've noticed that uh, many of the, almost all of the platforms within the UC space um, have within them certain features that when not adequately monitored or uh, uh, checked for abuse, um, that those features can be used to create significant risks to the enterprise. So we developed a UC analytics package that tracks all of the different sessions that take place within a UC platform. And we've integrated it with Avaya and Microsoft Link and GenBand and Broadsoft uh, and, and all of the major providers out there. And we're able to give our enterprise customers a very unique visibility into everything that's taking place on that UC platform. And by doing that, they can avoid some of these risks that are hiding within the UC platform. So we're, we're huge proponents of UC, but as it grows and becomes four or five billion dollar industry over time, we want to make sure that our customers are, and our partners and the carriers are deploying it in a responsible way so as not to introduce unknown risks into the organization, which we can talk about later. That's great. Yeah, telecom and UC in particular has been this kind of black box for ages where, you know, you can't see what's going in, you can't see what's going out, so it's pretty powerful. Yeah, so we help you look inside the black box, save right. money, and organize all that data. Excellent. Amitava, we, we just were introduced and kind of going through like uh, memory lane a moment Too ago. Much, I'm surprised yeah. we're not related. It's, it's shocking. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, well, want to introduce yeah. yourself? Right. Reg? Nice to meet you. Everyone. My name is Amitava Mukherjee. I'm the CEO of Redshift Networks. Uh, we're a company based out of California. Um, so we've been in the carry industry for, since 2012, and what we do is we provide uh, security for voice networks, so voice over IP specifically. Um, what we've seen is a lot of carriers, as they're deploying unified communications, um, some of the issues in there is security and to look at anomalous traffic patterns. So what anomalous traffic patterns are traffic that is not normal inside their network. So of course, that could be attacks, that could be misconfigurations, so it could be troubleshooting issues. So we've actually taken a look at that and looking at it from a analytics point of view, looking deep inside the network, so we have probes in the network, taps in the network, to look at all these traffic patterns of SIP traffic and looking for all these anomalies, and we've patented that. Uh, we call it a UCTM, a Unified Communication Threat Management product. Um, what we've seen is these attacks on VoIP networks are from all over the world. There are basically VoIP botnets that people have. Of course, you guys know fraud. Fraud is a $37 billion problem. That's one instantiation of that problem set. What they're doing is they're trying to steal your phone, and then they make fraud, right? So if you can actually protect them before they steal your phone, uh, through looking at deep analytics on the network, at the network layer, that's what we provide. Of course, all the other things that are along with it, DDoS, and there are like 40,000 different attacks on VoIP space. We work with almost 23 carriers around the world. Some of them are Frontier, CenturyLink, Comcast, AT&T, um, Telefonica, America Mobile, NTT, SoftBank, some very large carriers. And um, we've got a product that's out that people are in, like it now because SIP is getting a huge amount of deployment globally. As you know, the cable robbers are moving towards SIP, and so are all the SIP trunking is in growth, unified communications in growth. So we provide that deep analytics and anomaly detection layer that a lot of carriers need. And uh, we're expanding globally now. We're in mostly North America, and little tidbits in Japan and Mexico and, and UK. And of course, slowly we're glo expanding globally at this point right now. Thanks for being part of the panel. Yeah, that was fascinating. We, I worked for three SBC companies, and we never did any of this. So it's interesting you built a layer on top of what session border controllers, for example, aren't doing. Right, exactly. So we basically complement the SBC in every deployment we work with. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And Al, it was really good meeting you earlier. And I appreciate the video. You, you almost need a video introduction to talk about <laughs> your user experience and the value that console cloud brings. But maybe you could describe it in words, given the lack of yeah, a video certainly. here. So um, yeah, my name is Al Bergi. I'm the uh, CEO and founder of uh, console. Uh, we're headquartered in um, Silicon Valley, California, um, with uh, offices um, uh, globally. Um, unified communications, obviously, voice, video, 
Um, for us, it's you know an, another application, and it is dependent on network. Uh, organizations like um, Michael and Metro Optic do you know a wonderful job in helping organizations uh, connect to one another um, within a local region. Um, but when you think of unified communications from a customer's perspective, you know uh, they're worldwide and. Um, Voice over IP, for example, is something that uh, has a tendency to be very latency sensitive. And what Console has done is really created a platform that helps organizations completely bypass the public internet and directly connect to what's business critical. Um, this could be cloud infrastructure providers, it could be uh, SaaS providers, it could be uh, another organization within one's supply chain, uh, regardless of where they're located. And we've we basically have created various technology uh, including routing technology and so forth to make this happen at a click of a button. So imagine um, something similar to a social network where based on one's own self-defined self criteria you feel it's important to connect to another organization. Uh, you click a button, they accept and you're now directly connected. The user experience on our platform resembles that. Uh, we've extracted all of the friction and configuration complexity to help um, organization A to connect to B within seconds. And it could be enterprise connecting to enterprise or enterprise connecting to cloud or cloud connecting to cloud globally. It doesn't matter if the other organization is the other side of the city or the other side of the country or the other side of the planet. We've created that virtual equivalent of A and B being in the same room together um, without having to endure any of this configuration complexity. And, and they have now a, 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 a private secure, better performing connection um, to optimize uh, the user experience. And um, um, so that's, you know, in a nutshell, what we've created with, uh, with our console platform. Thanks. That's great. Last but not least, Brian, it's good yes. to have you um, here as a provider and that perspective. Maybe you could share a bit of background. Yep. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, my name is uh, Brian Shatku. I'm the CEO of the Unify Communications that everybody's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> So I, hope I you expect trademark that name. Some, do you have a chance to some trademark? royalties <laughs> from everyone who mentioned it? So I keep I'm keeping notes about it. But you know, uh, by bearing the name, we have a lot of responsibilities on the unified communications. And as such, obviously, we're involved in our uh, legacy uh, voice business, including IoT, and we're also getting into the infrastructure with our um, sponsorships of the Balkans Italy network cable. Uh, that it's a fiber uh, optic cable that will connect uh, Western Europe with the Balkans, which is an area that is currently underserved. Uh, what we uh, bring uh, to unified communications, uh, the solution itself, is we work with operators to better uh, maximize their ARPU, whatever their um, users are around the world, by targeting these communities with uh, uh, better offer, better solutions to basically maximize this revenue uh, per user. So. Great. Thanks very much. So the first question I, I'd like to pose has to do with evolution versus revolution. For those of you who lived and breathed telecom, many in this room for many years, you have sort of the personal battle scars of living the sort of TDM to IP sort of evolution, long, painful process, not yet complete but I think we're rapidly hitting on sort of revolutionary territory with a lot of the developments that have happened uh, over the last really number of, short number of years. Maybe you could talk about how you see that evolution unfolding and, and what are some of the key technologies and sort of initiatives, whether it's the API economy or some of the rev evolutions in IP networking that, that are really gonna accelerate this, this evolutionary process to really make it more impactful uh, to the enterprise, to the consumer so I think you know evolution versus revolution. Michael, do you want to sure. comment on that? Yeah, um, I mean I can't comment on it uh, from a user perspective mm -hmm. as much as as many of the other panel members can. What I can tell you is that I think fundamentally internet traffic is exploding, and you, you know I don't know. You, you look at the Cisco data, IDC data. You know we're growing three, fourfold within the next five years. Um, so we have to address that. Um, and I think there's an implicit assumption in that, that the infrastructure providers will do their job and they'll be well-funded and they'll support that. But also 
the middleware, the application layer, the unified layer that will support that. Um, and I think that's a big assumption, quite frankly. Um, now, what can we do? Where is the world going from where to where? What we see is that there's a big shift in where that internet traffic comes from, and that we need to support. So it's going from a transactional process-oriented IOPS type of queries to video and voice demand and, 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 and several other rich applications, but those two are the big ones. And then the question then is really how do we support that? And, and a lot of it is, quite frankly, has to do with simply capacity. So we need the network capacity and we need the data center capacity. And what we're learning is that the secret sauce we need to deploy is the interconnection magic in the middle so that people have choice, that there is redundancy in the system, that you know there aren't too many direct dependencies. The second piece goes to uh, a really uh, tricky issue of peering all that stuff and how can we help in the middle and what we are seeing is we need to become better at, at um, network architecture and how do you create the interconnectivity between these networks even as a data center provider and dark and lit fiber provider so that your enterprise customers you know understand why it's better to be here versus in another location Great, that's, that's very helpful. Uh, James, you want to talk about the move the enterprises are taking to become cloud-enabled, software-defined, and what that means for your business in terms of you know, revolution yeah. versus just some of the evolutionary stuff they've been doing for years. Yeah, so you know, it's an interesting thing, right? So I've been coming to this conference since it started about 10 years ago, and um, you know, one of the things when I'm sitting around with some of our when I go through this this type of show, I run into like 15, 20, 30 different people that I've gone to war with, uh, together with mostly, um, not against. <laughs> we're nice guy, but we compete. Um, and we and and when I go through that, you know, one of the things that if you really get us with about three or four scotches in us, and we start talking, right? So one of the things we'll talk about is the difference between the the folks that built the internet and the folks who capitalized on the internet, right? So, so we did all this hard work, right? We, we laid fiber optic cables, we built networks, we figured out topology, we got everybody to work together so we could pass information back and forth. And meanwhile, then a bunch of brats out in Silicon Valley went and created all these other cool apps and LinkedIn's and Facebook's and they threw it over the top, made billions of dollars and we're like, you know, that was relatively easy compared to what, you know, what we did. So. When I, I like look, the brats in Silicon Valley. I'm going to use that. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Brats in I Silicon feel like you know being yeah. in telecom for 20 years is more like being in the mob. Yeah. It's like you know, <laughs> once well, you once you're well, in, you well, can't these, get out. These so. networks don't build themselves, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when I when I look at things and you know, they're going into the future, I think one of the things that we're focused on, at least, is not just enabling infrastructure and enabling technology, but really to go beyond that and think about things like information, right? Information has value. So we're big into what the big data scene, all right? So one of the things we are always trying to do for our customers is to capture lots of information and create uh, queryable, reportable, searchable uh, databases that provide that customer with a lot of information on what's taking place on their network, okay? And lo and behold, as we're doing this, for whatever reason we're doing it, along comes this big word called you know, big data. And there's conferences that just talk about big data. And as you get into the big data, you start to, there's, there's two things that data analysts have, have issues with, right? One is um, they need to find data because the enterprise doesn't have it. And two, if they can find the data, they want to be able to organize it and, and manipulate it in a way in order to create value. So, I think where we need to be as an industry is we need to start helping customers turn information into profits and information into competitive advantages. So that's what we've been focusing on. And we like to think about all that information that we capture about, let's say, a unified communications platform, who made what phone calls, who made what was on conference calls, what was going on instant messaging, what was the text and instant messaging. That information is very valuable to a data scientist. So we're working hard to capture that information, put it in a reportable format, 
and then do partnerships with folks like, we do a partnership with a company called TrustSphere, and TrustSphere has actually taken that data and they begin to create these big, wonderful graphs that show you how your organization actually works compared to what the org chart says about how your organization should work. Okay, so I think that's going to be a big thing as we go forward is can we as either enablers, network carriers, solution providers with companies, can we give them information that gives them a competitive advantage and can we help them to sort that out and, and, and become a key strategic partner? Because I think for too long we've been selling to a small part of an organization at the IT level or the, or the telecom or our CIO level and then we don't get back up in the, in the organization. But if we can take that information, we can give them a competitive advantage, then CFOs, CMOs, CEOs, HR heads, those are the folks that all of a sudden become very interested and what you're doing. Great. Now, Mitava, you've, you've discovered the whole range of requirements that enterprises didn't know they had mm -hmm. until they opened up with these new services and applications and, and realized they had some major gaps, right? So maybe you could talk about what, what those are. And sure, sure. Yeah, so definitely. So basically, um, you know, what we see following to what James was saying about information and how to use that information at a higher layer. So we see a lot of that where we're able to take a lot of the security aspects of information of the anomalous data of information and then send it up to the higher layers, whether it be LinkedIn or other applications. Um, you know, what we see in the API economy is um, the need for integrating all that. So different companies are trying to take information and using that for their own applications, whether it be banking, whether they be finance, whether they be healthcare and others. Um, there's all, all a new area called conversational commerce, which is something very interesting also. And what that is, is really being able to use that data to do commerce. So I have a friend who started a company, and I'm unfortunately guilty in part of that Silicon Valley crowd, as they say. Um, so we started a company, and it's all about using voice recognition to look at sales data. So I come out of a meeting, and I, oh, I'm going to a meeting, so I'm going to meet Citibank, I want to find out all about Citibank, and I just talk into this computer system, and it tells me all the latest about what Citibank is doing, what their revenues are, what, their, what the groups are doing within Citibank. So it's just taking feeds off the internet and reading it to me, right? Then I come out of my meeting, and I go in there, and I can talk intelligently, and I come out of there, and then afterwards I talk about um, you know, what I learned in the meeting, and I send it into my CRM system by talking to it, and it starts integrating all that data and send it to all my sales team. So that's an application that's very interesting. It's part of this conversational commerce, which is these applications that are residing with the APIs, with the integration of some of the data James was talking about, and other points of data into some of the business layers, right? So we see a lot of that. And of course, being a security company, you know, security is a very key ingredient of that. So you're able to dissect that, that piece and make sure that you have silos of security in all of those segments is also very critical as we in integrate these environments also yeah, together. When, when I'm chatting with my artificial bot at Citibank, I want to know right. that conversation exactly. is, is exactly. secure. Right. So Al, right. it, you know, we, we were talking earlier and there's this over, often overused buzzword around digital transformation. And it's, but actually I think it really applies to what, what you're doing in, in the evolutionary versus revolutionary standpoint. Maybe you could talk about how you're really taking a revolutionary approach to how companies and providers connect and, and build, build networks. Yeah, certainly. <clears throat> um, in, in part, as you know, I guess part of that evolution, there is um, pressures on on um, various uh, CIOs and so forth, and in seeing their organizations adopt more cloud, uh, taking workloads and and processes and uh, and so forth that would you know typically be uh, um, uh, be conducted or um, reside on the enterprise uh, data center or enterprise LAN. Um, and now moving it to the cloud. And um, with that, uh, there's this realization now that uh, as, uh, you know, whatever the cloud service is, whether it's a cloud infrastructure or some uh, SaaS application or what have you, the enterprise becoming more dependent now on connectivity, leaving their building. Um, you know, i.e. Uh, public internet, for example. And the public internet is something that is really this, you know, best efforts utility. Uh, where you're not really in control over the path or direction of your data and, and so forth, and, and it's not consistent. It's uh, susceptible to various uh, performance and security issues and so forth. And so now when you have your valuable data living living in the cloud and you're moving that, um, you know, ideally you're cognitive of that uh, as part of that decision process, but you know, in many cases enterprises are realizing after the fact that now that, that, you know, now that they're more and more dependent on the cloud, how do we 
how do we um, you know attain better performance in in our experience in utilizing what we now have in the cloud, and so um, um, this whole notion of directly connecting, um, you know, it'd be it's easy I, I guess if you're using a cloud that is um, within relatively uh, close proximity, but what if it's you know a, a cloud company A is the other side of the country, you know, SaaS company B, uh, also the other side of the country, um, you know, for your financial partner or what have you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, globally. I mean, it's not necessarily in your backyard. And, um, and so for, 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 some, for those applications or, or cloud services that are a much greater distance, there's this need to then, uh, for organizations thinking of, of uh, dire uh, directly connecting to these sort of things. Historically, this has been something that has been a very manual exercise, needing to identify the location um, and building into that location, et cetera, et cetera. So it's highly manual, does not move at the speed of business, requires uh, the average enterprise to have a you know seasoned team of internet architects on staff to go and um, it can be very politically correct. Yes. It's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, you know, it, it's, um, it's, and it's not a one-time exercise, you know, and you need to manage and monitor all of this stuff. And so we wanted to create a solution that made all of that easy. All of the friction and complexity in every step of that process could be fully automated, such that an organization once on our platform just needs to click, uh, click a few buttons and the magic happens and they're completely bypassing the public internet and connecting to these business critical cloud services and so forth. Um, so I think this is a very important part of the evolution, this digital transformation that's happening and so forth, where um, you know, the, the you know, comment of the Silicon Valley brats, I mean, creating all of these applications and so forth, but no one really um, you know, taking the time to, yeah, I guess, reinvent or, or create additional um, technologies from you know layers one, two, three at the network sort of layer, and that's what we focused on, and how to make that better, how to make it simpler, and make it consumable, make it enterprise grade, and make it consumable for the enterprise, such that um, it helps enable cloud, um, taking away that friction, and 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 really allowing all of this to move at the speed of business. I need it. I need it now. Please let me click a button, you know, and, and have it happen. So. Fantastic. Thanks. Brian, you're a provider, so you have to balance all these evolutionary, interesting new services what, with what customers need and want today. Right. So how, how do you see that mix of delivering services today over what's the next big thing that you, you see on your agenda? Well, um, for us, um, cloud is very important um, because uh, the cloud allows us to repurpose our resources that you know previously we needed uh, to reach uh, to our customers. And um, as such, uh, I believe that um, utilizing, you know, the API economy, utilizing the cloud um, puts us in a better position um, to um, more effectively and more efficiently uh, reach to our customer and serve our customer better. Because cloud uh, gives you efficiency, it uh, gives you connectivity, and uh, at, uh, at a lower latency because um, you have your pops sort of virtually uh, located around the world. And uh, for us, it's uh, the movement to the SaaS into the cloud. It's, uh, it's not revolutionary, but evolutionary. But in the way we serve our customer, uh, it uh, appears to be revolutionary. So, Great, that's, that's helpful. Um, as you all selling into the CXO suite, you're selling to CIOs, CTOs, I think every last one of you here, you get these challenging questions about ROI. You know, what's my ROI in terms of CapEx? Uh, you know, dollars are tight in terms of OpEx, headcounts constrained, uh, you know, NetX in, in many cases, kind of uh, misunderstood part of the sort of financial model. So what, what's your position there? What's your you know, story, if you will, on how you, know, you can meet those, those drivers to reduce you know, all three elements of there as well as provide value add in terms of collaboration and communication. How do you balance those two? So I guess ROI is, is, is part of the next question for, for each of you. Yes. So uh, it's a loaded question. Um, the, I think it, 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 I have to say it really depends. Um, you know, for us, we're again an infrastructure provider, both on the fiber and data center side. 
The big question is clearly in source, in house versus outsourced. And what we see is an extreme shift from demand coming from uh, enterprise to demand coming from the digital economy. And we have to adapt to that. And uh, you know, with the enterprise, it's, it's an ROI on, okay, if I do this in-house versus outsourced with the digital guys, they know your, your business just as well as you do, and, and they actually know it better because they deploy in so many different geographies with so many different providers, you better be on top of your game. So, so if you're Snapchat, you don't have to show your ROI on uh, an investment. No, you don't. <laughs> okay. they, they, they'll get they'll right away come to the SLA and the price, and, uh, and they know exactly, and they'll shop, uh, they'll shop around. Right. And, uh, and they'll try to give you as short of a contract for as long of a capital commitment on your side. So I think it really depends in which bucket you fall. Um, and um, again, for us, it's the ability, what we really see the, the complexity of the ROI being for them is that, you know, what is cloud now and, and how do we work with that? Because it's efficient in so many ways, but at the same time, it's everywhere. And sometimes they need proximity to the eyeballs. This is something we com constantly come up with. And, and so they want services deployed uh, closer to the consumer of the services, but that creates an infrastructure challenge and an investment challenge. And uh, how, well, what does that give me then? Well, it gives me better performance. Well, that's important for the digital crowd. That is less important for uh, you know the enterprise customer in general. Now, if you talk to the transaction guys, you know they will spend adequately for extreme protection uh, and redundancy in the system, and uh, and that's again an element that is hard to quantify, sure. right? So I, I'm not giving you. What's the cost of not a, doing it? What's the cost of an outage? What's the cost? That's of That's it exactly. Yeah. So I can't really give you uh, uh, an answer that it has has really tight metrics around mm -hmm. it, but I think y y you have to be really good at at at. And this is is a challenge of getting to the decision maker one, and two is really understanding what's driving this this requirement, and that's business basics, but it's so much harder in this digital economy where everyone talks to everyone and they think they know everything and then you've got, you know, you're down two, three layers talking to, to the techie guy who's deploying it and you're talking to the sales guy who's giving you, you know, his cloud vaporware and, okay, what is exactly the application that we need to service? Where do you need it serviced from? What are your requirements for that in terms of performance? And, uh, and once you get to that point, um, you can do an ROI, because you know what you're solving for. 90% of the time, it is the hardest thing in the world to get to that the right person, to ask the right question, get a specific answer, and then being able to respond. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly selling one-on-one. -on -one. So James, when, you, when you're dealing with a CFO, maybe, or CIO, what is your story around the return on that investment and I guess pretty data driven given your, your products? Yeah, I, th I think, you know, th there's two things I'll touch on here. When it comes to U UC analytics, um, there is an ROI that's, that you can really calculate and watch because you can see how uh, the enterprise is utilizing the technology, right? So I, I like to think of thing, uh, spending on telecom and technology as investments. I don't use the word expense. I call, I call them investments because really there's a, there's a, you know, kind of a subtle underlying tone there that says we should invest in telecom and technology because it's going to make our people more productive and it's going to help us to have a better organization. Okay. And that underlies almost everything you see in the telecom space. And, and that underlying piece has moved us from TDM to VoIP to UC. And I think the business case is pretty strong there, but I'm, I'm going to go <laughs> kind of beyond that, right? I'm going to talk about security, okay? So you, you can talk to any CIO in America, and they will tell you about the vast amounts of money that they are spending to protect their networks. Security, security, security. And they are spending billions of dollars, arguably building walls that protect their enterprise from the rest of the world, okay? Now, I sat down with... Um, 
one of the heads of security for IBM, and, and he said, look, there's three major areas of security vulnerability in enterprise. They are platforms, processes, and people. And us kind of geeks, MIT geeks and so forth, we, we're cool with the platforms and the processes, right? We can get ourselves into that. But I gotta tell you, these people, these people are completely unpredictable, okay? And it's very hard for us to protect the network from people. And I just don't mean the bad people. I mean even the good people, right? So I'll tell you how, I'll tell you, how you can infiltrate any enterprise network in America, okay? Go out and buy a bunch of... Do we need to get the witness protection? Yes, witness protection, okay? Yeah, okay. So, so go, go, go in your drawer and collect a bunch of old keys that you have. Put them on a key ring, okay? Take a key fob with a USB port and put a virus on it. Now, make about 20 of these, go over to your favorite enterprise customer, customer and go into their parking lot and drop those sets of keys all over the parking lot without any identifying piece of information on the keys. What you will find will be all of these wonderful altruistic best employees that you have in your firm will find those keys and feel so bad for their coworker who has lost their keys, they will pick it up and they will bring it into the office. Unable to identify whose keys they are as it nags at them more and more, they will notice that it has a key fob on it. And they'll say, oh, God, if I plug this key fob in, I bet you there'll be some information and I can then identify the owner of these keys and bring them back to them, okay? And within a couple hours of leaving those keys around, you will be inside their network with whatever type of virus you want. And the billions of dollars of money spent to create security outside that will all have been bypassed in a few minutes by your best employees, okay? So when I talk about return of investment, I say, you need to watch your employees. You need to watch the bad ones, the medium ones, and even the altruistic ones, because they are going to do things on your network, utilizing the tools that you have, that potentially are going to put you at great risk. So uh, the ROI on a UC analytics package of 3 to 5% on top of a UC deployment is peanuts compared to the amount of money you can lose when your employees either deliberately or uh, altruistically jeopardize your security and bypass all of that wonderful software you've been sold. That's great. It's, it's, it probably doesn't hurt that that's ignored by most of the UC vendors out there, so it makes your life a little easier. Sure. Redshift, you have a pretty interesting but esoteric technology. How do you communicate that to the CIO and the value and the investment required? Right. For you. So um, this, again, going along with James, um, security is our bread and butter. And so, of course, security is a huge issue for a lot of companies. Um, Target, Sony, all the good things that you guys have heard about in the last year, CIOs losing jobs, et cetera. So such a big issue they're investing. I think it's a $100 billion industry or $150 billion industry. Um, there are gangs out there that are doing DDoS attacks, right? So DDoS attacks, there's a whole chain of people out there that it's about a $250 billion industry just evolving around DDoS. So basically there's a guy who does the DDoS, a guy who steals the data, so there's like a whole food chain out there. Same thing with fraud. So fraud is a $37 billion industry. There are people that actually go steal telephones, the SIM cards, etc., and there are people that actually do the actual fraud. So there's a whole, you can say a supplier, reseller, you know, a whole chain of command out there. Um, same thing for all these other attacks. So when we go into um, a company and we talk about ROI, the most important is what are you losing in fraud today? What are you losing in security today? What is the reputation to your customers? What is um, the impact of your business? Um, companies who get attacked, there's about 2.5% loss in revenue in a year after they get attacked. Of course, Target was a big issue. You know, their revenues went down, et cetera. I wasn't going to Target for the month, I think, but I heard that you know, cards were all stolen, right? Because I didn't want to ha have that happen to me. So you can Im imagine the impact of a company. So we talk about all those ROI numbers. Of course, when it comes to voice, it's a little different because people are used to all the the information about data threats, right? How about the voice threats? So what we see, it's interesting out there, is um, we show them, I mean, I have a site called, if you go to voip-attacks.directshipnetworks.com, you'll see actually the attackers attacking real carrier networks today. So what they do is they'll attack networks in New York in the morning, um, California in the afternoon, and Tokyo in the evening. So they're basically going, the same guys are attacking all these networks consistently. And so there is definitely a coordinated effort to attack these networks. And um, so we give them very empirical data because we're able to take a lot of the data that we see when we do the first trial with the customer. Uh, we can give the empirical data, what they're attacking, who they're attacking, what they've done to your network. 
And that way they have some really solid information to go build their business case within the CIOs and with the CTOs and CEO, CEO of the companies. Um, it is definitely a huge issue. Um, you know, just what you see in the data world, it, the attacks are happening in the voice world. Unfortunately, a lot of carriers don't know about it. So when we bring them the empirical data about what's happening in the network, there it's an eye opener for them. Oh, yes, um, that's, that's huge. I mean, imagine if you're one eight hundred flowers and your network goes down on Mother's Day. Yeah, right. good luck. Good luck with that exactly. Expl so explanation to your CEO. Right. So empirical data is also very important for them. Yeah. Al, uh, your ROI seems almost too obvious in terms of capex, but but opex savings and yes. efficiencies. But is that how you explain the value yeah. to a financial decision maker? Yeah, absolutely. So there's. Uh, I think it's Gardner that says that the average enterprise, uh, for example, is using um, 23 um, cloud services SaaS applications. Um, I think in the case of our company, um, just for our own internal use and so forth, it's uh, in four, in north of 40. Um, but that average of you know 20 plus, and it's obviously growing. Um, looking at uh, alternative methods for a CIO to actually go out and, and um, consume um, uh, these applications in a very direct manner, um, there's significant um, um, OPEX, reoccurring OPEX, and, and um, uh, you know, one-time CAPEX involved uh, for them. Um, but when, when leveraging our platform, uh, what they'll notice is um, north of 50% um, uh, savings uh, in OPEX uh, versus uh, many of these alternatives. And from a CapEx perspective, um, north of 95% savings. Um, we, and, and this is, you know, some of our underlying technology includes the fact that we've created uh, routing technology, so it's equally feature rich as that of a Cisco or Juniper or what have you, um, and not have to go out and spend tens of thousands of dollars. We, we, we own the IP and, and um, so it's, you know, we can, we have the equivalent for pennies. And uh, the ability to give that technology seamlessly to, intent, to an enterprise in every location that they would require that. Um, so we spin it up and seamlessly within our platform, there's these virtual routers. We've been able to virtualize it as well um, and allow it to spin up globally. And so there's a, a dramatic uh, CapEx savings um, for the enterprise when, you know, when leveraging our solution. That's a great story. Um, Brian, I imagine you have a lot of customers unhitching their PBX and moving to you in the cloud. That's probably one scenario, but what are some of the others that you see in terms of demonstrating the financial return on moving to you as a service? Yeah, um, just to continue on the security theme because it's a, a very important one. Obviously, your return on investment is as good as you secure it. Um, it takes one breach, one attack to basically uh, mess up your numbers for the entirety of the year. So. Uh, the, ARO, the ROI, it's affected by the investment that you do in, in securing this. So that brings down that percentage and it affects um, uh, the way you operate. But we live in a different world nowadays where basically security is paramount. And the biggest of them companies that have armies of IT people trying to make it secure get bridged. So you just hope you don't get, you know, you don't get, you get a bit lucky, but you also have to put the investment uh, to secure it, and that affects the ROI. And you know, we are facing a lower ROIs in terms of the uh, you know dealing with uh, with these new challenges that we're facing. Great. So, Jamie, how are we for time? Okay. Well, I think I think we covered a lot of really interesting topics, and happy. I think many of us are going to stay around here and happy to chat and discuss further. Thanks, guys. Thanks.